for being with us here on this Wednesday. We made it to hump day, Tyler. Oh, yeah. Thank you again for uh, filling in and doing everything yourself yesterday. <laughs> no, it's not the bad I've done it before. It's nothing, uh, nothing all too new. So. <laughs> went well, went all right. Show got done well, so it's it's all good. But there are a lot of buttons to push. And there are. It's a little bit of an adjustment. I had a couple situations uh, where I where I had both of these uh, m mouses over here for both of the computers and was messing up which one was which and having to <laughs> look around like, okay, stop. Re reset, which one's which, that's the one for this computer. Right means right, left means left, use the left one. Uh, so what you're saying is we need to get you two different colors. Now what, what, what it, we're saying is I just need, what, what we're saying is I just need to understand my directions left and right, so. So uh, yeah, I uh, out, so. had to take uh, yesterday off to go home to Ohio for a funeral. And uh, for those who have not been to a funeral during COVID, it is the strangest thing because obviously when you're in those moments, it's just natural to hug people. But do you hug? Can you hug? Are you not allowed to hug? Uh, you have a mask on. Do you not have a mask? And it, you're with your immediate family. But for me, my immediate family, I come from, uh, you know, a family of nine. So there's a lot of people in that immediate family. So it's, it, it's kind of a weird experience. It's just kind of surreal that seven months into this pandemic, this is the things that we're still going through. And I will say we were at least able to have a funeral, which is a little bit different than in the beginning. People, you weren't really allowed to have anyone there. Um, so now at least uh, things are a little bit more relaxed in that you can have them, but it was a, a, a private ceremony and uh, fewer people, but still fewer people when you come from a family of nine in my immediate family. Um, my mom's side is like, I don't know, 13. My dad's side is 13. So it's still a lot of people. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's all. That's a lot of people to be trying to be distant from, but also have conversations with as well. And you can't, um, yeah. you can't, people come up and you hug you, or you're supposed to, or you're not to. And then um, obviously for us up here, you know, I'm around so many more people. So I don't know, it's just a weird time. And I know that uh, there are uh, hundreds of families and thousands of families across the United States going through the same thing. But um, slowly but surely, one by one, we will uh, soldier on as we continue into COVID-19, seven months in. And I will say though, Tyler, things are not looking so good going in uh, to these colder weather months. Uh, like we knew it was coming and we knew it was going to happen, yeah. but obviously um, the numbers are starting to show exactly what everyone had predicted. And so, and it's kind of starting off yesterday my niece goes to the University of Michigan and I got the alert on the way home. U of M is now under a stay at, stay at home order. So the Washtenaw County is experiencing a rapidly growing number of COVID-19 cases. Leaders at the University of Michigan say many of them can be traced back to maskless social gatherings around the Ann Arbor campus. A response to the surge of cases in the county, the Washtenaw County Health Department on Tuesday issued a two week stay at home emergency order. So it's immediate and it runs through, guess what? 7 a.m. November 3rd. Uh, stay at home order uh, does not include Michigan athletics because uh, football players are scheduled to take on Minnesota on Saturday. They're going to be home against Michigan State Halloween. All Big Ten players are tested daily, but the order will require undergraduate students to remain in their residences unless they are going to in-person classes, getting food, and doing work that cannot be done remotely. I asked my niece because um, she's a U of M student. She had this big test coming up today that she was stressed out about if she was going to then just come straight home. And she's like, no, it just basically means we can't have any social gatherings. Yeah, I mean, that's what it comes down to. And that's all, obviously what's been the toughest part so far for the students at University of Michigan and uh, at other universities throughout the state of Michigan and the U U.S. as well. And that's why we're seeing these college campuses become uh, places where we have these initiators of, of spreader events like this and why we have a situation where 
until the morning of the election, an hour before polls open, that there's going to be a stay-at-home order in Washtenaw County because it's getting out of control. And frankly, the students just aren't, are clearly just not taking the responsibility to not go to these social gatherings, or if they are gathering for one reason or another, to not be, they're not keeping their social distance and not wearing masks. That's what happens. Well, and uh, it's not just the students as well, oh, yeah. because the numbers are starting to spike. And uh, the factors behind Michigan's COVID-19 surge, according to some of the health officials, they say the second wave of COVID-19 in the state becomes off its highest weekly total of confirmed cases. Epidemiologists are attributing the rise to colder temperatures driving people indoors, where the virus thrives, as well as pandemic fatigue. People are socializing less at bars and restaurants, which are restricted, but they also have somewhat of a false sense of security from the virus when they socialize at home with their friends. Michigan's surge in coronavirus infections this month is part of a global upswing that has cases increasing in more than 30 states, Canada and parts of Europe and South America. I think when you go seven months into it, some of the people that maybe have not lost a loved one due to COVID are saying, how long is this going on? How long are we not going to be able to live life, basically? And they're just tired. They're tired. It's pandem pandemic fatigue, but a virus has no deadline. It has no calendar. It doesn't care if you're tired or not, but it's going to continue. And people are saying, well, if I, you know, if I'm at home or if I'm with my friends, then that's safer than going out in public. To some extent, but I mean, but at the same time, you don't know all the people that your friends have been around and, and all the people that those people have been around and whether or not those people have taken their precautions seriously or at all. So it doesn't really make that much safer. And, and with the pandemic fatigue, yeah, I mean, we're seven months into it. It's, it's obnoxious. It's annoying. It's getting to the, it's, it's a huge headache and we want to all get back to normal. But it's, we, at some point, we have to face the fact that we can't do that right now. It's not time yet. And, we, when it, and we'll know it's time when we have a vaccine, when we have a cure, when we stop having community spread of COVID-19 around the United States, around the world, certainly in Michigan and in, in southeastern Michigan. And, and one of my concerns with this is that the second wave that this second wave that may or may not come during these next few months that we're already seeing the spike that's kind of that maybe isn't leading necessarily toward that second wave, maybe it's just a little bit of a precursor. But my concern would be that if there is a second wave, it could be worse than the first one simply because the first time around, one of the main factors that was keeping people cautious was the fear of the unknown. And now people seem to think that they understand where this is going and are get, getting complacent a lot easier. So all the more reason to continue to take precautions and just be smart about it. That's really it. Just just be smart, keep some distance, wear a mask. It's annoying, but you know, if, if nothing else, you're saving someone else's life if, if you are infected and uh, preventing further spread of this, which only makes this go on further. So I will, uh, if you head over to civiccentertv.com, click on coronavirus. That's where we post uh, the new headlines each and every morning. And it does look like the lawmakers and the governor are starting to get along a little bit better because they're able to get some issues around COVID-19 passed. One of the latest being the unemployed Michigan residents have up to an additional six weeks of jobless aid against Again, after Governor Whitmer on Tuesday signed two bills into law that the GOP-led legislator passed last week, legislation would extend the duration of jobless benefits from 20 to 26 weeks, which is the maximum for federal benefits. The bill also continues work share programs through the Unemployment Insurance Agency and waives requirements that an individual must be actively seeking employment if an employer does confirm a layoff is only temporary. So they do seem to be coming together on some of these more important issues and one of those being unemployment and the jobless benefits because if you lost your job due to COVID, and I think this is even more important as we start to see the numbers spike, if we go into a second surge and if they close more things down, this is going to be very important for those that need to be putting food on their table. Yeah, I, I mean, taking two, two and a half weeks to start making these decisions, I would hope that they have that they had prioritized 
enough to get the most important elements of that done as quickly as of these things done as quickly as possible. So yeah, it's very nice to see them taking action on this, working together in, in a bipartisan fashion for things that are critical to our society, critical to the state of Michigan, critical to our local communities, to those that are unemployed, and to those that could become unemployed again or for the first time over the next couple of months, several months, as this pandemic continues on into its second winter. And a little bit of good news just coming across the news um, lines right now is that Michigan nursing homes can now schedule indoor visits. That's according to the Michigan Health Department. They issued an order allowing indoor visitation by appointment at long-term care facilities if a facility has had no new cases within 14 days. So that is uh, for For the family members and for those that are in these long care facilities, there's some good news as long as they've not had any uh, new cases. But we do know that these um, nursing homes, long care facilities have really been the hot spot for so many of the COVID cases, as well as the outbreaks and the number of deaths as well. Yeah, and that's why there's so much there's so much caution behind this. You have to not have had, as you said, a positive case there in 14 days in in order to allow for these kinds of visitations. They are gonna be very limited as well to make sure you're not having a large sum of people coming in to visit their loved ones. And it's only specific people at specific times that they know are safe to come in. So, uh, I mean, Good timing for this um, is better than no timing for it at all. So I would say that uh, it's certainly something that's welcome to the people that have been living in the nursing homes and haven't been able to see their families for the past seven months. And for those families that are worried about their loved ones in these nursing homes and long-term care facilities. And uh, not sure how I actually feel about this next story coming up. Uh, Prisoners are now eligible for the $1,200 stimulus checks. Uh, Most of the 35,000 prisoners with the Michigan Department of Corrections are now eligible for the $1,200 stimulus checks after a federal court ruled the governor or the government rather can't withhold the funds from people just because they're in prison. MDOC sent information to all inmates on October 15th on how to uh, access the funds. Paper claims must be postmarked by November 4th. So deadline is coming near while online claims are due by November 21st and estimated 150 million Americans received stimulus checks from the Coronavirus Aid, Relief and Economic Security Act earlier this year. One of the things I uh, wonder about that, and it's not to say that they're not deserving, but as someone who didn't really, did not receive the stimulus checks, I like to remind people, this is not free money from the government. This is tax dollars, and that bill is going to come due one day. And the stimulus check is designed to be able for you to fill in the gaps when things are shut down. Well, if you're in prison, you're not, you're already receiving everything that you need from the state or or, or from the government, right? You're already getting your meals. You're already getting uh, whatever you need, but... So why do you need that extra $1,200 if you're not living on the outdoors? You're not paying bills. You're, you don't have a light bill to pay. We're already paying that. So as someone who didn't get the stimulus check, I'm kind of like, eh. But on the other side, I also wonder if this helps goes to those that maybe have to pay their victims. If this money could go towards that, which would be a good thing. Yeah, I mean, this this. For, there's surely some good that can come of this, but it, there, there are questions that rise from it too, because as you said, this is from our tax dollars. We are going to eventually have to pay these back, this, this money back into the system uh, down the line. And you know, for those that are in prison that are not necessarily working, that have not had to work outside or not uh, of, of the uh, facility, or those that are making very little wages for work they're doing inside the facility, paying that back too, it's going to become a, a problem down the line, could become a problem down the line also. So a lot of questions with this, but it, it, it makes a lot of sense as well. So you'll find those stories and so much more if you head over to civiccentertv.com. Just click on coronavirus. Along with the day's headlines, you'll also find links 
to many different organizations uh, to make it easy for you. So if you want to find out what's going on with the latest with the CDC, the state of Michigan, Oakland County, and our local communities, you could just click on civiccentertv.com. Just go to one page instead of Googling each page individually. So we try to make it easy for you. Tyler and I are going to take a quick break here on the Oakland County Megacast. Still a lot to get to on this Wednesday edition of the Oakland County Megacast. Hi, my name is Kurt Lawson and I'm the Public Information Officer for West Bloomfield Township. We wanted to reach out to you, our older adults, to provide information that you may find useful during this difficult time. We want to ensure you that West Bloomfield Town Hall our Waters and Utility Department, West Bloomfield Parks, and our Police and Fire Departments continue to work hard on your behalf. Information and resources can be found on the Township website, the Police Facebook and Twitter, or call West Bloomfield Parks COVID-19 Help Hotline. Please remember to keep your social distance of at least six feet, wear facial coverings when you leave your home, and wash your hands for at least 20 seconds with soap. These precautions will help keep you safe during these difficult times. Michigan, we're calling on you to save lives. Don't ignore it. Don't let it go to voicemail. It's urgent. In fact, it's critical. Because if you've been in close contact with someone who tests positive for COVID-19, you may have been exposed to the virus. And you could get a call from My COVID Help or your local health department. So please answer the call to learn how to protect yourself, your family, and friends. We're calling on you to stop the spread of COVID-19, to make it safe to reopen businesses and help Michigan move forward. So if you get a call from My COVID Help or your local health department, you may have been exposed to someone with COVID-19. To protect us all, answer the call. Learn more at michigan.gov slash contain COVID. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Thank you for being with us on the Oakland County Mega Cast. I'm Ronnie Dahl here in the studios alongside Tyler Keith. You can catch us Monday through Friday, 10 a.m. to noon here on Civic Center TV, Birmingham Area Municipal Access. If you have cable, catch us on Channel 15 on Comcast, Channel 99 on AT&T. If you're out driving around, you can tune us into your radio, 89.3 Lakes FM and 88.1 FM, The Biff. Each and every day, Tyler and I are here in the studios working to bring you interviews with people throughout Metro Detroit as we all try to navigate the COVID-19 crisis, more than seven months into it. And it doesn't seem like there is going to be an end in sight anytime soon until that vaccine is uh, out, developed and widely available to the public. And so many people are impacted, including our religious organizations. Metro Detroit has the 21 largest Jewish community in the nation. More than 72,000 people belong to the Jewish population here and no greater area than right here in the West Bloomfield area. We're excited to have with us this morning on the show, Rabbi Jennifer Kalusny. She is with Temple Israel. Thank you for taking time to be with us here on the Oakland County Megacast. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really honored to be here. What's so hard about our religious organizations, it's about a community, it's about people, and it's about connecting. But COVID has caused all of us to pause and how we're connecting with one another. How is Temple Israel bridging the gap in this crazy world right now? So what's amazing about Temple Israel is that we're the largest congregation in uh, Michigan, the largest reformed congregation in the country, but we have a really small, intimate feeling. And actually we have the nickname of the kissing congregation. We like to greet each other with hugs, with kisses, with handshakes. And so um, there's a lot of connection. There's a lot of physical connection and we being together in our sanctuary or in our outdoor sanctuary to pray together. Um, is a feeling that we were really concerned that 
we couldn't recreate virtually. And seven months in, in, I'm really proud to say that our worship services have evolved such that I think that we really achieve that. You know, at the beginning, um, there are six rabbis and two cantors. We are all in our own homes and we were creating services through our cell phones. We were each uh, participating and then putting them together and editing them. And we would put them on Facebook and our YouTube page and we would watch with our congregants and we would talk to them as the service was going on and we were interacting that way. And they said actually that seeing us with our families and in our homes and really kind of made them feel like we were all spending Shabbat, the Sabbath together. So just having that kind of intimacy was surprising and wonderful. And most recently we've had the challenge of the Jewish high holiday is which is a time when we gather at Temple Israel in the thousands. Literally, we can have 10,000 people come in and out of our congregation in two days. And every congregation in the country was speaking to each other and we said, how do we do this safely? How do we bring people in? And at the end of the day, we decided we could not do it safely. And the health um, and safety of our congregants is, is most important. And so we created um, services, some were highly produced. Uh, we're very lucky, we have wonderful congregants who are in this industry and they helped us create uh, beautiful services that I think really touched people. The feedback has been extraordinary that even if people have said, I never thought that sitting in my own living room watching a screen could make me feel like we were together ushering in the new year. And so I'm really proud of Temple Israel that I think we've made the transition very well, but we still feel like it's a challenge that we face every week um, on Shabbat, on the Sabbath. And we're always, always looking for ways to connect um, even more with our congregation. The ones I worry about are really the seniors. Young people get it. They're growing up with this technology. And even the people that are a little bit older who maybe are in their, you know, 40s, 50s, 60s, we're adapting to it as well. But the seniors, I worry that they're being left out. Anything being done to directly try to reach out to the seniors, members Ab of your of your faith? Absolutely. And I have to share with you, I've been um, a hospice chaplain for 20 years. I spend most of my time doing pastoral care and chaplaincy, and I absolutely love seniors. I think they are the most interesting, funny, engaging people. So this has been at the top of my list as well. And really the cornerstone of Temple Israel is pastoral care. And so when the pandemic began, we mobilized an army of volunteers immediately to call every member of our congregation 80 plus. Now we have a membership of over 3,400 families, which we estimate is roughly 10 to 12,000 people. So that's quite a large number. Once those calls were completed, we took the age down to 75 plus, and then we went to 70 plus. Now that those calls are completed, we are starting over and we are going to continue them regularly. Um, because I spend a lot of time in assisted livings, uh, facilities and nursing homes, I called um, each of them to make sure that they knew uh, how to access our services online and if possible, if there were devices, be it iPads, smart TVs, where they could socially distance seniors safely, that they could worship with us on Shabbat, on the Sabbath. Um, we actually, just now we have a, a fund at our congregation in memory of an amazing man, his name is Isaac Pan of blessed memory, his wife Yetta um, has helped us bring, we actually brought the Detroit Symphony Orchestra, a two piece, um, part of the orchestra to our Jewish uh, senior living, two of our buildings, which are on the JCC campus at Maple and Drake. And they were in a courtyard and people were on their balconies so they could hear the DSO. It was phenomenal. Um, we are working with families. We're working with caregivers to zoom us in to people's rooms. Um, even at the end of life, I had a family call me, their loved one was dying and they knew she was COVID positive. And so I said, the best way you can get me close to her is put me on FaceTime and we can sing together, we can say prayers together. And that's what they did. 
And so we've been trying to do that as much as possible. And we want our congregants to know that if they are allowed in the hospital or in a nursing home with a loved one, call us, put us on FaceTime, um, join services with us, because we know that the isolation on seniors is so difficult as have um, issues with dementia, the idea that they can't see faces, even if they can't remember their loved one's names, they know the face is familiar and to not be able to see them has been absolutely crushing. And so we are doing everything we can and we're working on even more initiatives to get our faces and the love and connection of our congregation into these facilities and into hospitals. Rabbi Jennifer Kozluzny with, with us on the Oakland County Megacast. She is the rabbi at Temple Israel in West Bloomfield joining us today on the program. And uh, Rabbi, so much of this pandemic and moving to virtual has been about maintaining those connections um, through faith, through faith and, and through services. But there's so much in these, in all religious communities in our, in our area that has to do with outside of serv- outside of service based uh, community involvement to keep the to keep these groups so close knit and to keep up with people's lives and to continue to have that interaction. How do, how has that been continued virtually or at, or at all by Temple Israel throughout this pandemic? So we always keep in touch with our members. Um, in different ways who are going through different life cycle events. Um, Of course, when we shut down our congregation in March, we were the first congregation to say we are no longer having services. And we basically turned Temple Israel virtual in two days. Um, But that meant that we had quite a few bar and bat mitzvah students, probably 50, who did not have their B'nai mitzvah, the, the ceremony of the coming of age ceremony when they were 13. We kept in touch with those kids. We made sure those teens knew that we understood how hard it was for them to work for this, to anticipate this huge event in their lives and have it be postponed. So we kept in touch with our Barn Bat Mitzvah uh, teens. All of us who had weddings coming up got in touch with our wedding couples and said, how can we help you through this process? How can we make this process still special and plan for the future? We continue, right now, we have our religious school happening outside. We have a large campus. We actually put up a tent, a giant pavilion over our outdoor sanctuary. It usually seats 600 and we are having a maximum of 60 socially distant. So we are still having our religious school, kindergarten through 12th grade on different days of the week, outside in different venues to stay connected with all of our families from our littlest ones to our our high school kids. We're keeping in touch with our college kids who are now, a lot of them are going to college and instead of maybe going back and forth are at home. I just heard your guest before talk about Washtenaw County and how there's a stay at home order in Washtenaw County. Um, We are doing programming that's reaching beyond Temple Israel. Um, I took part in a program with the uh, Black Jewish Coalition where we invited uh, Susanna Heschel. She is an incredible author and speaker and thinker and professor that had over 600 attendees to talk about what is going on in our world in terms of racism and anti-Semitism, walking in the steps of her, her father, Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel of blessed memory. Um, So we are creating different kinds of partnerships with not only local organizations, but also national organizations in order to reach as many people as we can um, through either their personal needs, their emotional needs, or perhaps uh, an interest that they might have. So we're doing our best to kind of, if, if you will, you know, open the tent as wide as possible to bring in and kind of wrap our arms virtually around as many people as we can. Rabbi, I've been lucky enough to attend a bar mitzvah at your temple. It was a beautiful ceremony, but it is a party afterwards as well. But I think (laughs) about these, uh, these kids and they're not kids. They're now teenagers, right? And the work that they put into getting up there on stage and so much pressure on them and and it's not a 
one week preparation they're preparing for so long so what do you think is going to be the future and for those types of ceremonies when will they return or are you going to treat them like weddings where maybe 40 people can return or 50 people can can attend or could it just be immediate family So, as always, and what happens here in the Zoom world is we seem to uh, have a little bit of a freeze on the rabbi's Zoom call. So, um, hopefully, we're going to try to get her back here quickly. Um, I, Whenever we experience this, which we've really been pretty lucky because we haven't had this a whole lot, is... I think about the teachers and what this must be like for them each and every day because so many of them are using, if not this platform, a similar platform. And thank yeah. you for, are you back? You're back. I'm thank so you. Sorry. My son is in third grade in the next room and my husband is a lawyer and he's working. So I think, I think there's a lot of bandwidth being used. So Got I it. apologize, but no, um, no, that's okay. Trust me, <laughs> we're used to it and we understand what Thank everyone you. is going through right now. Thank you. Um, so we began them again and we actually had to change the format of the service. Our teens do start nine months before their bar or bat mitzvah to begin studying. And we changed the format at such that the rabbi and the cantor, my musical counterpart, could be at least 12 feet away from the teen. I am not used to that. I am usually standing right next to them. When they are chanting from our Torah, from our sacred text, which is all in Hebrew without any vowels or punctuation, if they lose their place, I'm right next to them to put them back in place, as is our cantor. So we had to kind of make the service self-sufficient so the student could literally run the entire service themselves with just some uh, guidance from me or what, whichever rabbi was at the service uh, via microphone 12 feet away. And let me tell you something, these teens have amazed us. They have risen to the occasion and every family without fail has said, this wasn't what we were expecting, but it was beautiful and it was meaningful. And we're so proud of how our teen was able to pivot and rise to the occasion. And and we've been so proud. And it's true, there, the, the celebrations that usually happen are not happening that way. We have had some families who have chosen to have an outdoor, socially distanced, people sitting at tables with people they live with, sort of small reception. And we have had some families say, we're gonna wait. We're gonna celebrate together when we can. And we've had some families say, you know what, it's okay. We did great. This is something we'll never forget for every reason possible. And we're proud of our team and our team is proud of themselves. And it, it, it's okay just the way it is. It, it, everyone has a story to tell during this pandemic. Rabbi, quickly before we let you leave, anything you wanna get out to the public? I know you guys are doing so much over there at Temporal, Temple Israel. I, I, COVID-19 testing, so many virtual programs, mm -hmm. anything that you want the public to touch on or to let them know about what's going on over there at the synagogue? Well, I wanna thank you for bringing up that we actually are a COVID testing site. We have COVID testing tomorrow in our parking lot from nine to four. Um, you don't have to sign up for a time. I did it with my daughter last week. Um, it is easy, it is safe. And I highly recommend anyone who's, who needs to be tested to come to our parking lot. And, and what I would say is our programs are open. A lot of what we do is on Facebook Live. Some of it you do have to register um, on Zoom, but our programs are open. As I said, we wanna open the tent and, and open our virtual doors wide enough that everyone feels welcome. And truly as, as a leader of a house of worship, um, I know that my um, colleagues at not only the, the, the temples and synagogues in the area, but also the churches and the mosques are, are wanting, wanting our leadership and our houses of worship to be places where people feel safe, where people feel that they can come to. And, and I do mean virtually. 
we're about to start office hours so people can sign up and know there's always a rabbi available because we're also just really good listeners. And I think that right now, clergy all over the country want people to know that we are here as kind of a safe harbor in this storm that just doesn't feel like it's going to end. And so, you know, we at Temple Israel and at congregations throughout West Bloomfield, throughout Michigan, we want you to know that we're here to serve as many needs as we possibly can because we're in it with you. We're parents, we're children. I haven't gone near my parents in seven months. I miss them, I wanna hug them. We are experiencing the same things. And so we want you to know we are in this with you for as long as this goes on. And we will be here for you when, when this ends. I think when this is over and if it ends anytime soon, we'll all look at a hug quite oh, differently yes. than ever before. But the good thing, hopefully that comes out of this, maybe people who were interested in the Jewish faith, but were too intimidated to ask or to come to a service, they may mm -hmm. just log on and be able to, to use it as an educational time to learn more about the Jewish faith Absolutely. and all that you are doing over there and for our community as well. So we want to say thank you so much for being with us on the Oakland County Megacast. And we wish you and all of the members over there the best of luck. And let's just hope thank this you. ends soon. Thank you so much. I wish you health and safety. God bless. And, and quickly before I let you go, do you want to get sure. off the website for those that do want oh, I would love to, to maybe log on Thank to? You. Because I, I know you have so many virtual events going on as well. We do. We have all kinds of good stuff going on. We are at temple-israel.org. And you can find us um, on Temple Israel's Facebook page. We also have a YouTube page where you actually can see our archived services and programs and all kinds of good stuff. But definitely head over to temple-israel.org and say hello to us, join us. Great, thank you so much. I will say you have more YouTube followers than I do. So um, <laughs> thank you so much for being with us. It was great speaking with you. Uh, Tyler and I are gonna take a quick break here uh, on the Oakland County Megacast, uh, uh, when we come back, we'll be sh shifting our focus just a little bit and talking about the schools. Um, this is impacting so many people throughout our areas across the country, across the state, and here in our own backyard. So we'll be checking in with a couple of the superintendents when the Oakland County Megacast returns. Michigan, the coronavirus pandemic has put us all to the test. And now, it's time to put COVID-19 to the test. As we move forward, testing will be critical. We encourage anyone who has reason to get tested to do so, those with symptoms and those without. If you are leaving home and going back to work, get tested. If you think you may have COVID-19 or you've been exposed recently through family, friends, or coworkers, get tested. Our test locator tool can help you find the right testing site that fits your needs. Even if you're looking for easy access with no cost, no prescription, and no appointment necessary, we've got you covered. Help Michigan move forward, not backward. To find a testing site or learn more, visit michigan.gov slash coronavirus test. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. here on the Oakland County Megacast. Monday through Friday, 10 a.m. to noon, you can catch us, Civic Center TV, Birmingham Area Municipal Access, Channel 15, Comcast Channel 99 on AT&T. And if you're out driving around, catch us on 89.3 Lakes FM, 88.1 FM, The Biff. And the great thing about today's world and all this technology, if you can't tune in live during the show, you can also uh, just log on to civiccentertv.com and all the full interviews are posted there each and every day. But also be sure to go ahead and follow us on social media as well. Uh, great to bring in our next guest. This is still such a trying time for so many parents, so many teachers, as we are continuing to try to navigate to COVID-19 and all things crazy with COVID. Um, 
and uh, trying to get people uh, get the kids back in the classrooms how do you do that how do you do it safely one of the individuals in charge of trying to help navigate this crazy world for the west bloomfield school district dr gerald hill thank you for being with us we always appreciate your time uh, are you looking forward to a vacation <laughs> uh, yeah ronnie ronnie that would be fantastic except my wife and i talk about that I think a vacation would be walking the trails in West Bloomfield. That's, and we do that regularly. So, <laughs> Oh, my goodness. I could just, uh, I don't even want to imagine what you and your team have been through during this entire crazy COVID-19 crisis, uh, just since uh, all the way back to March. Um, and then you kind of catch your breath. You had the summer off. You catch your breath. But then it's still lingering. We're in the middle of this pandemic. Give us an update where West Bloomfield School District stands right now. Well, as you said, it's been a, a constant uh, whirl of activity since March. And, and it would have been nice to have the summers off, but our staff was pretty busy engaged in planning for the fall. And in the fall, we're still planning for the fall and, and what's to come next. Um, I just need to give kudos to our staff our, our administrative leaders, our school board, uh, the principals, teachers, and all of the support staff in the West Bloomfield School District. Uh, everybody's doing yeoman's work. And, and our motto, our shining light, our, our focus is the health and safety of students and staff in our community and in our school district. And so uh, juxtaposing that with the educational needs and the mental health and well-being needs, uh, to say the least, we've been extremely busy. And we know these aren't normal times, and I feel like you and the others on your team are in such a hard spot because some parents want their kids back in the classrooms, some parents don't want their kids back in the classrooms, and then you have teachers weighing those two options as well. It's like a lose-lose situation. How do you try to navigate all of those voices to come up with a plan? It's almost, Ronnie, like uh, you have the left hand and the right hand and you're hearing the uh, the COVID fatigue and I need to get my students back in school for a variety of reasons, uh, home situations, uh, the, the education plan is different to those that um, really are really hesitant and, and not anxious, they're anxious about going back at all. And so whenever we make an, a decision or an announcement, we get feedback from both sides. And so it, it's and it's been pretty equal. And, and so... Um, my my focus really is on the health and safety aspect of it and the educational quality aspects. And so um, we are working with our parent groups, our parents individually, uh, answering questions that they have concerns. It's an impossible task to try to, for a lot of families, to be the, the breadwinner and the education facilitator in your home. And, and we understand that. And so, you know, we have the hybrid model, K-8, to but our high school is fully virtual, has been, and for the foreseeable future will be. And so for, for families that um, don't have the, the setup at the homes or, or have jobs that don't enable them to be with their children full time, that, it's a challenge and, and we recognize that. Um, but it's, it's all for the health and benefit of the students and the staff. Now, one of the other things we're hearing about, there are so many uh, students, there's a, a different form of bullying now going on. You know, we talked about bullying so much before this pandemic, and now people are having a direct view into individuals' homes. And so bullying has taken on a different form, per se. The mental health of some of these kids coming out of this I would imagine is is a concern for you and in so many of your staff members and your teachers as well. It is, and, and so there are a couple of things we're doing on, on that front, Ronnie. Um, we do have a school mental health specialist, and we have some restorative practices coaches, and, and they're working exclusively on the, the mental health aspect. We're doing a lot of professional development, staff development with our teachers and administrators. Uh, the whole camera on, camera off aspect um, sometimes it's not appropriate for the camera to be on and, and, and we're, you know, coaching our teachers that there are different situations in the homes where, where that really isn't the best time to have a camera on. So we're looking at other ways we can engage uh, students in the lessons as well. Uh, on the student to student aspect, the, the bullying, 
Um, we are a capturing kids' hearts school district, and capturing kids' hearts really emphasizes positive relationships, student to student, staff to student, and and all of our teachers or most of our teachers online as well as as the hybrid in classroom, they've developed uh, social contracts with their classes, uh, what the expectations are of one another, and and uh, bullying is a, is a, is an issue. Uh, or harassment or teasing even. Maybe it doesn't go to the extent of bullying. And so we're asking each, everybody to respect one another. And through Capturing Kids Hearts, it's something that we have been doing for a few years now. So the students identify with that. And so you can see social contracts uh, that have been developed uh, virtually, if you will, for how do we um, treat each other online. Dr. Gerald Hill with us. He's the superintendent of the West Bloomfield School District with us today on the Oakland County Megacast. Uh, Dr. Hill, going back to the return to learn plan, it's constantly being updated by the school district, by the school board, as, as it is in, in many other school districts as well. It's a moving, it's a living document as we continue to uh, move forward through this pandemic. How is what we're experiencing right now, what West Bloomfield's doing right now with Lakers Online and with their in-person and online hybrid at the K through eight level, how is that impacting how the school district is reimagining schooling in West Bloomfield, both in the Im immediate future in the next semester, the next year and two years, and into the distant future as well as technology is certainly going to have a continued impact on education for years to come. Well, Tyler, Tyler, that's a that's a great question. As you know, when we first got into the virtual learning last March, it was flipping a switch, and it was a very crude um, implementation of online learning. and And our teachers had to overnight uh, learn how to teach online, and that is not an easy task. Uh, over the summer months, uh, like I alluded to earlier, there was a lot of professional development. Uh, we've increased our improved our learning management platform. Of course, the teachers are learning that system as they're using it. Um, and, and we've uh, gained a lot of insight into what works and what doesn't work. Moving forward, we have a committee right now at our high school, West Bloomfield High School, and it's, it's really a return to learn for the high school once our area gets in the, a phase where it's safe to bring students back. And, and that committee, they're looking at everything uh, about high school. Um, what can we use when we reopen that is working now, uh, what can we maybe not go back to? And I'm gonna say, uh, let's take a look at the start time. Historically, our high school started at 7.03 a.m. Uh, every morning. With the online version, it doesn't start till 8.30, 9 o'clock. The feedback that we get from students is that they love sleeping in. Uh, their, their biological clocks are geared to not 7 a.m being in a seat in the classroom, but just maybe waking up. And, and so we're gonna be looking at our start times. Uh, also, teachers are, are also looking at what they're doing instructionally. Uh, give a giving a lecture face-to-face -face is one thing, but you can have a combination of blended learning plan where you are presenting material online and then having more lab and class discussion activities, project activities in the face-to-face -face mode. And so I, I would see uh, continuing that in some form or fashion, and and then there is a whole issue of of assessment. Uh, how do you how to assess? One of the things that I'm hoping to come out of this at the state level is that we get away from the high stakes testing and trust the teachers and the school districts in our state to assess students' learning, as opposed to uh, giving MSTEP or um, some other tests. Uh, just what is important for for learning, and what can we do to increase student achievement? Uh, as opposed to filling in bubbles on a piece of paper. And, and Doctor, let me ask you, uh, how do you think that it may look going forward? Because one of the things that you are hearing, there are a lot of students that are struggling right now with this remote learning or the hybrid situation. So if they're not thriving under this format, is it really feasible to implement something like that long term? I think, Ronnie, what we need to look at is, and we're doing some of it now, is giving students and families choices. And uh, I, I think the, the more choices that we have for, uh, which is, how do I learn, is what's my preferred way of learning as a student? 
and, and giving them options. Uh, there can be, we'll still, I imagine, have Lakers online, which would be totally remote, but I would see much more combination and blended options. And, and I think there needs to be the, the traditional uh, scheduling, if you will, and classes. But I think we can look at it maybe more like a community college, especially at the high school level, where it's not bell driven. Um, you're, you're taking classes and the people are, are coming and going and, and it's managing the, the process differently than we do now, but it's giving students and their families uh, more choices. And I do love the aspect and the thought of maybe some of these programs being put online for later review because for whatever reason, maybe a student missed something. And so being able to go back and re-listen to a lecture could actually be beneficial to them as well and if they can do it on their own time. We're speaking with Dr. Gerald Hill here on the Oakland County Megacast. He is the superintendent of the West Bloomfield School District. Looking at that right now, of course, the state has been putting out the, the list every Monday about outbreaks in schools. What is your thoughts on that? Is it beneficial or is it taking away from what schools are trying to do? Well, I, I think it's, it's, it's uh, putting a focus on what's happening with COVID-19 within the school system, uh, pre-K to college, actually. And, and I don't think that's all bad. I think it's a, a, an attempt to be transparent. Um, fortunately, in West Bloomfield, to date, we haven't been contacted by the health department, and we're not on that list. I imagine we will be at some point because uh, the incidences of COVID-19 are increasing in our state, not decreasing. Um, I, I think the looking at it as a point of information and then for, as I would as a superintendent, where did it happen? Uh, is it an outbreak? Did the students become in contact with COVID-19 in school or was it in the community? Um, and, and make sure that we do the contact tracing, not we, the health department, and make sure that we communicate with, with families and, and teachers I know teachers are, are anxious, those that are in the hybrid, and they, they want to certainly have the students there, but they also um, want to have them there in a safe manner. And, and so we need to re maintain vigilance, and I think it's just a way so that we don't forget um, what's, what's happening. You know, we, you mentioned earlier in the show this whole COVID-19 fatigue, and, and I think it's ironic. When we closed, there were less than a dozen cases in the state when the governor closed the state. Um, now we're up to close to well, we're well over a thousand, fifteen hundred, two thousand cases a day, and people are <laughs> they're they're sick of it. Uh, but the cases are as high as they ever were. Uh, back in June, I thought we might be going to phase uh, five and be more open. Uh, now it looks like we'd be closer to phase three. We're still in phase four, which says that we're improving, but I don't think we're improving uh, as a state. So it's a uh, tenuous situation and schools are a part of it we're a part of the community and uh, if we can, can communicate what's happening with our, our community and families uh, that's better for everybody do you worry that we will move back into phase three i certainly do what i hear I, you know it's unfortunate from my perspective that a public health crisis has become a political uh, battle and, and i don't see the politics in it i look at it from a health and safety perspective and I do understand the challenges of parenting in this environment when you have to go to work and your students are at home and childcare and monitoring and facilitating the learning. That is a huge, huge issue. Uh, but I'm, I'm confident that we'll, as a community and as a state, be able to deal with it. But we need to be working together and, and really listening to uh, the health departments and the, and the scientists and, and my challenge to the politicians is to let's not have this be a political issue. Let's look at it as a public safety issue and, and pull together on it. That is such a great sentiment and a great thought because we are all in this together. And moving forward, what do you think the future looks like for the West Bloomfield School District sitting here knowing what you know today? So um, we're constantly looking at the plan. As you said, our school board approved our return to learn plan. We meet monthly. Uh, this earlier this week, they approved the plan as it is. On November 9th, on the short term, we'll be coming to our board with an update, if there are any updates to our plan. One of, one of the 
interesting uh, challenges is that we have one set of guidelines from the state, phase one, two, three, four, five, six, and various levels of risk. And then we have another set of guidelines from the Oakland County Health Department. And of course, they don't call it phase one, two, three, four, five, six. They call it A, B, C, D, E, F. And, and so we're trying to do a crosswalk between those two because we're in weekly communication with the health department. And, and so um, from low risk to highest risk, we're right now in the medium risk category. And as long as we're in the medium risk category, we can do our hybrid program. I would like to get, I mean, we're in the medium high risk, I'm sorry. I would like to get to the medium risk where we could do more face to face, but I think we're closer to a high risk. So it, it's a matter of monitoring the data, maintaining the communication, listening to the experts and and then um, for the community it's um, having uh, we need to co constantly be communicating with our community um, we are having uh, uh, launching staff surveys this week we'll be doing community surveys uh, the following week and we'll be doing webinars and uh, focus groups and, and a whole host of communications uh, strategies to get feedback from teachers, from students, from parents as to what they feel is working, what's not working, and moving forward, what can we do to improve uh, the services for students? Well, one thing I, we have to remember is this is a new experience for teachers. Every teacher in the United States feels like a first year teacher. And I recall many years ago now, my first year of teaching, I was lucky to stay one week ahead of the students in terms of my planning and, and getting organized and all of that. Well, we have 350 teachers in our school district, and it's like they are all first year teachers because everything is so different. And so we are supporting our teachers as much as possible. Our, our support staff, paraprofessionals, the same. And, and I think um, the more we communicate with each other, teachers, parents, students, the better. Talking about the teachers as well, some of the teachers have been maybe teaching for quite some time. These kids are smart when it comes to technology. They are they're smarter than us. They're smarter than their parents. So it's got to be hard to stay on top of them, trying to navigate a new platform, trying to teach, but also battling their knowledge of technology over your own. Actually, if the, you know, we had a case of the first early time in school, the Zoom bombing. So we had to change our authentication uh, protocols so that uh, we can track who's on and we can't share that information uh, because of exactly what you said. The students figured it out real quickly and, and uh, idle minds come up with creative ways to be disruptive. And, and so that's what was happening across the United States. Uh, and so, but, but to the students' credit, they're not afraid of technology. They're, they're willing to do anything. And as a matter of fact, when we do our focus groups and surveys of students, I think we need to tap into that. They're, they've lived, they've grown up with technology and, and they would certainly have ideas on how we can leverage it more effectively. And so bringing them into the conversation is a, it would be beneficial to not only the students, but the teachers as well. Dr. Gerald Hill with us. He's the superintendent of the West Bloomfield School District joining us on the Oakland County Megacast. Dr. Hill, just another couple of minutes with you before we'll have to say goodbye today. Uh, is there anything else that would be important for our audience to know, for the parents, students, and staff of the West Bloomfield School District to know, or anything else that we haven't discussed today that we should, uh, that we should be speaking about? Now, I think I'll just reemphasize the importance of keeping lines of communication open. If you have a question, ask it. Um, we try to respond to all the questions that we get. Uh, also to, to understand that the, the teachers and students are, are working to the best of their abilities and capacity, and we all can be supportive of their efforts, and, and we are. And, and I think that um, to look at the whole issue as a, as a public health slash education challenge, and, and that um, we are very capable and creative and determined people, and, and I know that we'll find this path forward. And uh, looking back maybe a year or two from now, um, maybe we will come out of this with some uh, better ways of teaching and learning than we had going into it. And we will also have a much greater appreciation for the role of teachers in our society. Uh, it's not an easy job. Um, it's, it's a challenge. You're making thousands of decisions every hour. And, and those decisions are impactful for all the students that you work with. And I think 
parents, uh, having to have experienced a, a lot of that at home, have a greater appreciation. But uh, again, I can't say enough for the teachers, not only in the West Bloomfield School District, but throughout Oakland County, because they, we rolled up our sleeves. Um, we're keeping students first, and and we're providing uh, top education for the students that we work with. And there are mistakes we make along the way, and, and then we learn from those mistakes and we monitor and adjust. But the bottom line is, is for the students' health and safety. Dr. Hill with us here on the Oakland County Megacast. Thank you so much for your time. And I think you definitely said something that resonates with every single parent out there as they appreciate teachers and what they do so much more following this pandemic. So I, I let's hope that our teachers can get a raise coming out of this, but also that we learn and we grow as well. And that sometimes our system, we need to be pushed to be able to make change. And this is just, just the push that is being forced upon everyone to make changes and so hopefully some will be for the better in the long run. Thank you so much, Hill, Dr. Hill, for being with us on the Oakland County Megacast. Uh, we're going to take a quick break here on the Megacast. And when we come back, we're going to continue the conversation about education with the superintendent for the Avondale School District. Michigan, we're calling on you to save lives. Don't ignore it. Don't let it go to voicemail. It's urgent. In fact, it's critical. Because if you've been in close contact with someone who tests positive for COVID-19, you may have been exposed to the virus. And you could get a call from My COVID Help or your local health department. So please answer the call to learn how to protect yourself, your family, and friends. We're calling on you to stop the spread of COVID-19, to make it safe to reopen businesses and help Michigan move forward. So if you get a call from My COVID Help or your local health department, you may have been exposed to someone with COVID-19. To protect us all, answer the call. Learn more at michigan.gov slash contain COVID. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Hi. I'm Dr. Jonay Caldoun. I'm the Chief Medical Executive for the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. The people who are at highest risk of getting severely ill from COVID-19 are the elderly and those with chronic medical conditions. That includes people with heart disease, diabetes, COPD, or those who have compromised immune systems. People who are in those categories should right now be staying at home as much as possible and not going out if it is not essential. If you fit into one of those categories, those are the things you should do. And if you have a family member who fits into one of those categories, you should be checking in on them and making sure they are following those guidelines. There's something everyone can do to protect the community from COVID-19. This is 89.3 WBLD, Orchard Lake, 88.1 WBFH, Bloomfield Hills. Continuing our conversation about education during the coronavirus crisis, we are going to bring in Dr. James Schwartz. He is the superintendent over at Avondale School District. Always great to have you with us here on the Oakland County Megacast. And I'll kind of start off with a different question in that do you believe you're more tech savvy now than you were at the beginning of this crisis? Well, good morning. Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. We have uh, certainly uh, ramped up on our, uh, our tech literacy, as I would call it, um, from, a, from an organizational standpoint. Uh, you, you know, everywhere in the organization has had to resort to new technologies to navigate this COVID environment. Um, in, you know, from the classroom to uh, administration, central office, I mean, we've all had to use technology uh, differently and more creatively than we certainly had pre-COVID. I'll tell you what, though, all the updates are driving me crazy. So I think I figure out Snapchat. I think I have Instagram <laughs> down. TikTok, I just watch the videos. I don't post. But I think I have Snapchat down. Then they do an update. And then I have to get a new tutorial from my niece and nephew, and they're college kids, but they're like, really, Aunt Ronnie? But now, even with that, 
um, Zoom, which everyone is using, they keep changing and tweaking their platforms as well. Don't they understand that anyone over the age of 40, we don't like change? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it, 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 it is a challenge, that is for sure. Uh, it, you know, for, for those of us that are Gen Xers, uh, yeah, it's a little bit more of a challenge. You know, as Dr. Hill was speaking prior to, to me, you know, it's for the, the, the millennial generation and the Gen Z gen generation, I mean, technology is inbred in them uh, and they, they can navigate these tools uh, far better than, than we can. Um, and they can certainly, when it comes to the updates and those types of things, they're on it better than we are. Yeah, these kids are smart, but at the end of the day, they still need that in-person, face-to-face learning because as much as we love technology and it opens up new worlds for us, it doesn't replace that face-to-face -face human interaction. Yeah, when do I you totally think, it, will it ever get back to what was normal or will normal be just completely different from here on out? Well, I think normal is going to be different. Uh, I don't think normal is going to be what it was pre-COVID. Uh, and I, I don't think that's a bad thing. Uh, I think that certainly through, through this, we've learned how to uh, modify and adjust instruction to, I'll say, better meet, meet the needs of students. Uh, we certainly have learned how to manage technology a lot more efficiently uh, in our environment uh, and how to use technology, frankly, uh, with our, you know, as a, as a supplement to our instruction uh, or as a tool to drive our instruction. So I, I think that through this, we've certainly learned lessons that have changed what normalcy will be uh, from, uh, from that instructional delivery standpoint. Uh, I even think that when we're back in seat, uh, that instruction will be a greater part of the school day. Uh, and I also think that there will be um, greater opportunities for students to uh, to be involved in school technologically. And I, I think that uh, districts from here on out essentially will be offering more of a smorgasbord of remote learning opportunities for students moving forward because there there will be that demand. I mean, there are students that are flourishing in this remote environment. Uh, and I, I can foresee that many families, even when school is back in seat, they will still want to choose to stay remote. I mean, even post COVID. Um, so I think that uh, in terms of how school districts need to modify and adjust their options for students, that, is, that new normal is going to be different. So, well, so much uh, of your funding is based on those kids in the seat. So are you worried going, you know, in down the line that some kids are maybe going to um, choose not to come back to mainstream school, edu private public education? Because online learning is really nothing new. It's been around for years. It's just new to us in the public education setting. True. Uh, I do think that I do think there will be, you know, a subset of students that will continue to just learn remotely, um, you know, particularly um, the upper grades, you know, high school age students uh, that are balancing a work schedule and school, uh, you know, a remote schedule can be far more convenient for folks that are juggling work, school, you know, uh, you know multiple commitments. So, uh, you know, I do foresee that, that moving forward. And I think school districts, frankly, have to uh, up their game in terms of being able to reorganize themselves to uh, adapt and offer those opportunities to students so that they are not losing those FTEs uh, from, from a funding perspective. And talk about reinventing yourself as a school district when, you know, there's so much to the, the phrase where people say, but this is how we've always done it. And sometimes getting people or even organizations and dealing with unions, people of that nature to change can seem like you're moving mountains 
but in this case because we've had to change those words really no longer apply and do you think that's going to help make some of these changes permanent for the better down the road yeah i do i do i think because some of the you know we've always done it this way mentality uh has been forced to change and, and i and i think that um certainly you know folks uh, their eyes have been opened and you know there has been flexibility that's been forced upon operating in, in this environment. And so I think moving forward uh, to change will, it will affect it more easily uh, in terms of the open-mindedness to change. Dr. James Shore is with us on the Oakland County Megacast joining us today. He is the superintendent of the Avondale School District with us this morning. And uh, Dr. Schwartz, currently, uh, currently many other school districts uh, are continuing to update their return to learn plan the current plans as time goes on sometimes it's month to month month to month sometimes even every every couple of weeks as they get feedback from parents and students and as the response to COVID-19 changes what discussions have been had with the Avondale School District uh, at the administrative level and with staff and students about this and, and what may be some changes that Avondale schools, students and, and families experience coming down the pike uh, in the next several weeks or several months? Sure, sure. sure. So obviously the, the back in seat planning, you know, has been something that the district's been working on for months now. Uh, we've been, we've been a, a, a hundred percent remote uh, for the first 10 weeks of the school year. Uh, our board of education back in August had um, had determined that we would uh, spend the first 10 weeks all in a remote fashion. So we've been working really since that point to um, devise plans for, okay, what happens after that 10 weeks? Uh, you know, what, what comes after that point? So we've put together plans to, uh, to offer the options for parents that wish to go back in seat to do so. Um, uh, so our planning has been uh, um, looking at uh, how we integrate in seat and also how we continue to uh, offer remote for, for those families that want to stay remote. Uh, so we've had uh, really three, three board meetings where this has been a major topic. Um, and we've received obviously a lot of community input, a lot of staff input uh, via those uh, venues. We've also had a town hall uh, for elementary, a town hall for secondary, uh, in which we further received more input from folks on, uh, you know, on, on the plans going back. Uh, ultimately, our board just a couple of days ago on Monday night had uh, passed um, a motion to uh, have our kindergarten through grade eight students return back uh, on November 16th. Uh, and then our high school students will return back at the end of the semester uh, in January, which would be January 19th. So our kindergarten through eighth grades are on a trimester schedule, uh, which is why that November 16th date uh, lines up with sort of the end of their marking period. Uh, and then the high schoolers will start uh, consequently at the end of their marking period uh, in January. But um, uh, we, in our surveys, we've sent out several surveys uh, to, to our community and to our staff over the past several weeks. Um, and from a community perspective, in terms of the confirmations of folks coming back, it's really 50-50 uh, in terms of those who prefer to stay remote uh, and those who wish to have their students back in seat. Uh, and so, so with a 50-50 split, essentially, that allows us to bring back students uh, into a seated section or sessions with proper social distancing and, and mask wearing and all the protocols without having to do, uh, you know, necessarily a, a, an AB alternate day or alternate alphabet day type of scenario. Uh, so that allows us to come back to a, a full five day program at uh, elementary. Uh, and then our secondary, our middle school, high school will be back in a, in a four day in seat with a one day remote um, day schedule. So uh, we're just in the midst now of firming up what that schedule will be because now we've got 
some exchange of teachers and students because we have to devise all new schedules for now to allow for the in-seat uh, uh, students to come back. So there's a lot of scheduling that's going to happen here in the next couple of weeks to prepare for that November return. In some cases, uh, students will have a new teacher come November um, because of that, you know, uh, allowance now of two options. It's got to be so hard to be in your position and to try to weigh all these voices because every parent, every family, every student has a different perspective in what works best for them. And I know that you and your team are working around the clock trying to balance all of these issues and these concerns to come up with the best plan. But knowing that and opening up the schools again, I'm sure that you're going to be prepared for what is already happening at schools across the state of Michigan and the metro Detroit area in the in the outbreaks of COVID-19 that are happening and plus the reporting of that on the state website. How is that going to be addressed when you do get students back into the classrooms? So we we have very specific protocols that uh, are going to be utilized really is throughout the organization, but um, that are um, devised by the Oakland County Health Department. So we're really under their auspice uh, in their protocols uh, for, uh, you know, in terms of, of identification regarding symptoms, uh, in terms of quarantining, in terms of contact tracing, uh, you know, all of those protocols we've, uh, we've developed uh, in concert with, uh, with the Oakland County Health Department. We have nurses here in the district that are on um, on staff uh, that will be uh, helping us with those decision making uh, types of scenarios where we have to send students home or, or we have to close a classroom or close a school or so you know we've got all of those protocols down pat. I mean we do expect that we are going to have COVID cases, I mean, we'd be foolish to think otherwise. Uh, we know that we're not immune to that. Um, and we know that sending students back into classrooms um, is a risk, uh, but uh, there's gonna be a risk no matter when you decide to do it. You know, there's arguments about, well, you know, why come back now? Why not come back after the holidays? Uh, and then people argue, well, don't come back after the holidays because that's when everybody's getting together and there's a greater chance of, of spread because of, everybody congregating for the holidays. So, you know, the bottom line is there, there is no good time. There is no ideal time to bring students back. Uh, there's never a risk-free time. Uh, so recognizing that we have to make sure that our uh, protocols for prevention and our protocols for response are very thorough and, uh, you know, well thought through and ready to go and 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 we are it helps when you've had time uh, you i feel like you're an expert at this now what seven months into the pandemic yeah. uh, shift 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 again pivot 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 again uh seven months into it and it's good that you have a plan in place and i'm sure even with that plan in place when things happen things will still need to be navigated to get you through any type of crisis. Dr. James Schwartz with us here on the Oak Clinton County Megacast, superintendent for the Avondale School District. Anything we didn't touch on that you want uh, the parents or the teachers to know uh, about going forward? No, you know, it, it is, uh, you know, going back to school uh, and, and navigating these the instruction, whether it's it's in seat or it is remote, is is a uh, it's really a, a community effort. Uh, it's really something that we all have to join arm in arm in uh, and support each other with, uh, and have patience with. And because you know, do we have all the answers? No. Can we control COVID? No. You know, can we guarantee that no one's going to get COVID in our plans? No. You know, nor will anywhere you go have that, those guarantees or, you know, those lack of, of risks and so on. But understanding that, you know, uh, you know, our community has been very uh, supportive overall and understands the complexity of, of the situations that we're all living in. 
And although we, we sympathize with everybody's inconveniences and how this, this disease has really altered people's lives, it, it's turned you know, uh, lives upside down. Uh, and it's, it's extremely difficult from a parent perspective and from a, uh, a teacher administrator perspective. Uh, but I think there's a general understanding that, yep, there are a lot of co complexities. Uh, we're going to join arm in arm and we're going to help solve these, these issues as they come up. We're going to provide for the best uh, instruction uh, in the most safe and secure way that we possibly can uh, under the circumstances. And we're going to um, solve issues again as, as they come up. And, and again, I, I think it's our community has been very supportive and patient with that and, and will continue to be. And, and, I, and I would ask that people, uh, again, that, that may not understand that to, to you know, reflect upon that, that we, we don't have all the answers and no one does. And, and we're all working to make the best of it. Um, and, and it's a learning experience for all of us. We will learn and we will become better as we go. And having a little grace uh, during this uh, trying time because everyone is trying their best. Thank you so much. Dr. James Sports with us here, superintendent for the Avondale School District. I know you and your entire team are working around the clock as well, trying to navigate the, this crisis and doing what's best for the students. So we want to say thank you. And hopefully uh, next summer vacation, you'll get to actually take a very long, very well-deserved vacation to somewhere fantastic. Tyler and I are going to take a quick break here on the Oakland County Megacast. And when we come back, we are going to be speaking with the CEO of Focus Hope. This is the Megacast. This may seem uncomfortable, but so is being hooked to an IV, sleeping in a hospital bed, and fighting for your life. When it comes to COVID-19, Comfort is not as important as saving lives. Wearing a mask can greatly reduce the chance of spreading the virus. So mask up, Michigan, every time you leave home. Hi, my name is Kurt Lawson, and I'm the Public Information Officer for West Bloomfield Township. We wanted to reach out to you, our older adults, to provide information that you may find useful during this difficult time. We want to ensure you that West Bloomfield Town Hall, our Waters and Utility Department, West Bloomfield Parks, and our Police and Fire Departments continue to work hard on your behalf. Information and resources can be found on the Township website, the Police Facebook and Twitter, or call West Bloomfield Parks COVID-19 Help Hotline. Please remember to keep your social distance of at least six feet Wear facial coverings when you leave your home and wash your hands for at least 20 seconds with soap. These precautions will help keep you safe during these difficult times. Happy to have you tuning in to the Oakland County Megacast. I'm Ronnie Dahl alongside Tyler Keefe here in the studios of Civic Center TV and 89.3 Lakes FM in the greater West Bloomfield area. Just a reminder, you can catch us on the Birmingham Area Municipal Access or Channel 15 on Comcast, Channel 99 on AT&T. Check us out on our social media sites as well and civiccentertv.com if you're unable to tune in to our live interviews in this show which airs Monday through Friday, 10 a.m. to noon, we do put clips of all of the interviews up on our website at the end of the day. We're excited to bring in our next guest here on the Oakland County Megacast for, uh, I mean, since the 60s now. Focus Hope has been the fabric of the Detroit community offering social services and job training to so many people in need, changing countless lives we're so happy to have with us here on the oakland county megacast the ceo portia roberson for focus hope thank you so much for being with us i start off by saying can you tell us a little bit about focus hope although i think so many people already know about the great work that the organization does 
Well, good morning and thank you so much for having me. I'd love to have an opportunity to talk about Focus Hope because although we've been around for 52 years now, um, we're in a new time. And so there are younger people who don't know anything about Focus Hope. So I'd like to reinforce why Focus Hope was started and, and what we're doing now. And so um, quite honestly, Focus Hope was started out of um, the sort of rebellion of 1967, Father Cunningham and Eleanor Jositis, suburban, a white suburban mother and wife, um, decided that really after the 1967 rebellion in 1968, the way in which they would build back the city and the community where Focus Hope is currently located was through establishing Focus Hope. And Focus Hope started as both an advocacy group and certainly, um, about workforce training and getting people jobs and, and elevating their economic status. And that's certainly some of what we do still today. So um, I've been at Focus Hope two years now. Um, seems like it's been a little bit more than a lifetime, especially with this last year. <laughs> but um, honestly, the work continues. And so we're still there. And, and Portia, I know that you have a background. Um, you're a lawyer who also worked with the city of Detroit and their civil rights uh, division. But when, I think now more than ever, Focus Hope is needed, but is it also in a way discouraging that more than 50 years later, we're still having this conversation and we feel like we're back exactly where we were 50 years ago? Ronnie, you hit the nail on the head. I, I remember right after the George Floyd murder, um, I, I had an all staff, virtual all staff meeting. So I got everybody on the phone. That's about 175 employees. And I should say, I got them, everybody on the computer. Um, and, you know, I, I basically teared up because I felt a little bit like, what would I say? You know, this is exactly why we were started 52 years ago and we're sort of in the similar position again today. And so, in addition to coming or not even coming off of, but in addition to being in the midst of a pandemic, we had these issues that we really needed to address. Um, and so, yes, it's been very difficult to sort of look at where we have been and think, you know, and not think that's exactly where we are now. I think there have been great strides, but I think it's a reminder that the work continues um, and that the work that we do is very, very important. And can you talk to us a little bit about that work and how are you managing this <laughs> in the middle of a pandemic because so much of what you do is reaching out to the community? It really is. So so just to give you an overview, we really have four basic things that we do at Focus Help. Um, we do workforce training and typically that is people come into our site and we are training them on various equipment and they have classroom instruction and other things and then there's job placement related to that we have a center for children where we operate a head start and an early head start program we serve about 250 families through that and we have our food for seniors program which serves approximately 42,000 seniors per month in macomb wayne oakland and washington counties um, and then all of that is done under the lens of advocacy about how do we lift people out of poverty, how do we fight racism, and how do we do it using those other three areas that I've spoken about. And so, you know, one of the things that I've said repeatedly is that um, because of my pessimism and my earlier roles, both in city government and at the federal level, I was hearing a lot about the pandemic and a lot about how people um, were saying, oh, the city's gonna close down, the state is gonna close, things are gonna be closed, you're not gonna be able to go anywhere. And I remember talking to program directors and saying, you know, guys, what are we gonna do if, if things close down? And everybody sort of said, Portia, we're not gonna close down. And, and, and rightfully so, who could have imagined, right? Like I've never, never in my lifetime have I ever seen anything like this. So the concept of that we would be shut down and people would not come to work um, was so foreign to everyone. And, and then it happened. And the good news about it was that because I had been kind of pessimistic and hearing these things and started putting it out there, um, the team at Focus Hope really was ready and prepared to pivot right away. And so, we never stopped. We never stopped for one day. We haven't closed one day of this whole entire pandemic. We immediately shifted our food program. Typically, you can come in and shop in one of our food centers, the one located on Oakman Boulevard, the one in Easter, Michigan, and the one on the east side of Detroit. And instead, we went to curbside pickup, just like you do at a Kroger or at a Meyer, or we would home deliver. Um, for our workforce training, we made sure that in that last week before we were hearing that we might shut down, that we sent students home with laptops. And we made sure our instructors were able to go live on, you know, on the computer and do the instructions um, 
virtually. And then for our Head Start program, same kind of thing. We started doing home visits virtually. We started having um, educational packets for our little kids. We started also doing things that we typically don't do, which is providing diapers and wipes and formula and snack packs for parents who overnight had their kids home with them you know, eight, 10, 12 hours additional to what they were accustomed to um, and needed some additional assistance. So we really never stopped um, and we have not stopped. We probably will not go back for some time because we've operated very well virtually and we've been able to service our clients. And that's been my main focus and the focus of everybody at Focus Hope is that let's make sure we can give our clients what they need and meet them where they are. And as long as we can do that, of course, my other directive is to make sure I can keep our staff safe. And Portia, how has it been reaching out to some of the people? Because one thing that has come out of this pandemic and this crisis is the glaring focus put on the fact that so many people and so many families don't have internet access. And so when we're all talking virtually, we think it's just this easy snap of the finger thing. You open up your computer and you can connect with one another. But there are a lot of families out there that are still struggling with getting internet access and not only that reliable internet access so that they can have four or five kids on virtual classrooms at the same time. Yeah, I mean, you know, it, it, it really points out, it pointed out for me my own sort of sense of privilege because I have two laptops at home, you know, um, fairly decent internet service. I don't have children, so I don't have children at home trying to share that internet service with myself. I think the biggest thing was, you know, lighting for these kind of interviews. Right, so, right. you know, really just, but I mean, you know, you, you don't even think about those things. You go through your daily life and you think that everybody has that. And so that was one of those things that immediately was glaring for us is that people did not have um, the devices, nor did they have the internet service. And so one of the things that we did, and we were very lucky from a lot of our funders who stepped up right away and said, how can we help? Is look, let's get people connected. Let's figure out ways with, with um, funders and with our families to get them connected. And so sometimes that was a direct reach out to Comcast or Human IT or some other companies to figure out how can we get people on the internet? Um, because we just, we, they just didn't have it. The other thing that came that was really apparent right away is, you know, we heard a lot in the very beginning and we still hear it now about building a, a strong immune system, being able to exercise, but more importantly, getting fruits and vegetables. Well, in our food for seniors program, we give out a supplemental box, which is primarily non-perishable foods. Um, again, taking for granted the fact that if somebody tells me, you know, boost your immune system by getting more fruits and fresh vegetables. I just drive over to a store and I pick up great things, sometimes organic, sometimes not, but nevertheless, it's not an issue for me. For lots of folks, that wasn't an option. So we partnered with a lot of other organizations to make sure in addition to our supplemental food box for their monthly allotment, we were also able to give them some fresh fruits and vegetables, other things that would help out. But it really has become very glaring um, to all of us, I think, that are doing this kind of work, that there are lots of people that live very much, not just week to week, because we've always talked about, you know, whether or not you had your paycheck could go further or, or those kind of things, but just sort of the, 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 the things that we all take for granted because we've all kind of had them in our homes for so long. And internet access has absolutely been one of those where we've seen that the need is there and we've got to get people more connected. I, I love that you touched on the issue of fresh food. Uh, I did a homeless retreat on the streets of Detroit a, a few years ago, and one thing that we noticed at all of the shelters, fresh food was so hard to come by. And it's like you said, we need that for our bodies to nourish our bodies. So it's great that you and Focus Hope that you're recognizing that and that you've stepped in to fill that gap as well for the people in need. With that, one thing we say is uh, we're coming out of this with different skill sets and hopefully... Uh, Something good is going to come out of this. What do you think that's going to be for your organization? You know, I, I've said this repeatedly that I think one of the things it did do when you come into an organization that's 50 years old when you when you join it um, is is making a culture change and figuring out what the future of Focus Hope looked like was was difficult for me and and difficult in the sense that you know people would I think our natural um, our natural response to things is well we've always done it this way right and I would be you know, butting my head against the wall. Well, it doesn't matter that we've always said it this way. We need to figure out new ways to do things. And I think one thing that, pan one thing that the pandemic did is it forced us to think about 
other ways to do the work that we do. So um, particularly when you're talking about workforce, um, we were very hands on. We were very much a student would come. They would sit in our classroom, uh, you know, for a couple of weeks at a time. Um, and then they would go out and they would work on machines in the, on the floor. And we never really give a, gave a lot of consideration to the fact that we needed to be able to do a lot of this virtually. And in many cases, when students couldn't complete the course or missed a certain number of days, they would automatically be out of the class. And, and we knew that there were some barriers that were preventing them from coming, but we couldn't, we hadn't made the adjustment to allow them to still participate. And so now we've got all these virtual classes running. We just had, I think our fourth graduation on Friday in both our manufacturing pathways group and our IT classes. We're continuously adding more classes that we can do virtually. And I don't think quite honestly, we'll ever go back to people sitting in a classroom all day long. I think we'll do, um, we'll have people come into our facility to do their hands-on work, but we'll vary it by day so we don't have a lot of people. So, you know, the thing that will come out of this for us is we'll, we will look and operate quite differently than we did in the past. And I think that's good for us and good for our students. I think that's a great thing because you wonder too about so many people that have transportation issues or child care issues. So this is going to allow them to continue to better themselves without those barriers. It's just one barrier that's knocked down during this. So as you mentioned, you'd only been with them for two years. <laughs> one year, you, you, got, you had a little bit of time before the pandemic to step into the role, get your feet wet. But as a leader, this has to have been so challenging for you. Yeah, you'll see, you know, uh, I don't know if you can hear me taking this deep breath because it really has been, and, and I'm not alone. There are tons of leaders, Kirk Mays at Forgotten Harvest, you know, gleaners, all, all people doing this work. I mean, United Way, everybody's had to kind of figure out um, their sort of new reality in leading these types of, uh, of organizations. Um, and I think we've all just sort of share a lot of ideas about what has worked and what hasn't worked. I think there are things that we started back in March that we've pivoted on already that, you know, maybe didn't work as well as I thought they were going to work when I initially implemented it. I think the biggest thing for me and the thing that I, I worry about most is keeping the staff and now the children that we have back in our Center for Children only two days a week. But, you know, what worries me at night is making sure that everybody stays safe. We did a lot around for our volunteers because we always still need volunteers. When you're feeding 42,000 seniors, you have to prepack a lot of boxes, right? And so we had to shift our focus there. So people would come in, they had socially distant marker, distance markers. So they would stand in the right place on the floor. We installed portable hand washing sinks. We did hand sanitizer everywhere. We mandated that everybody wear a mask, but you still worry that you can somebody gets sick, right? You don't want to be part of any kind of spread of this uh, this virus. So um, that's the thing that I think most of the leaders are challenged with, especially if they still have people coming in and out. Is how do you do it and maintain safety for not only your staff but for the clients that you serve? Portia Roberson with us. She is the CEO of Focus Hope, joining us today on the Oakland County Megacast and. Uh, Portia, your organization has a couple of signature events each year, the Heroes for Hope and Eleanor's March for Hope that culminates in your annual October event, the Weekend of Hope, which just recently happened. Can you review for us what went on there and, and how it's provided a, a positive impact to our local area? So I'll tell you, um, this was the first year we did both of those events virtually or either either of those events virtually, I should say. And so it was a shift for the entire staff to do it um, virtually. But we had a great weekend. We started with a, a breakfast where we honored a number of, of uh, civic leaders around Detroit. Um, we honored uh, Dr. Darian Driver Hudson from United Way, uh, Jim Tobin from Magna, uh, Jim Farley from Ford Motor Company and uh, Coach Casey from the Detroit Pistons, who he and the Pistons have been a great help in terms of packing those boxes and delivering those boxes. So great weekend, great Friday morning start there. I got a chance to have a, a back and forth with Jim Farley, the new CEO of Ford Motor Company, and um, talked a lot about his love of racing and, um, you know, just leading an organization as big as Ford Motor Company during this time and what the changes are that are coming to Ford Motor Company. And then on Sunday, we did our Eleanor's March for Hope. And a lot of it, you know, as you might imagine, was 
pre-recorded, um, but our partner Click on Detroit and WDIV um, put a lot of that out there for us. Um, and it just was an opportunity to talk about some of the issues that we think are really important from an advocacy, advocacy standpoint. Um, you know, we talked about this year, um, the disparity um, of COVID-19 in communities of color and what it meant to say, you know, go get fresh fruits and vegetables when there weren't fresh fruits and vegetables available. And then we talked about, you know, the school to prison pipeline that still exists. And there was an issue this summer around that and, and dismantling that pipeline so that kids don't end up in the prison system because of some severe punishments that are happening in the school districts. And then of course, as an organization led by a woman, we talked about pay equity. Um, how can we make sure that women are getting paid as much as men um, and that, you know, in this day and age when um, we have a, a, a woman vice presidential candidate, are we making sure that women are being lifted up in every space and making the same as the men are, contempor their contemporaries that are male? So um, we have three big advocacy issues we're going to be talking about for the entire year. But it went off, you know, as well as you can be expected. Your last guest talked about having grace during this period and patience. And I think those are two of the things that we learned during the Weekend of Hope this year. Um, good for me, good for our staff. So uh, we'll keep going. Hopefully we want to do it virtually next year, though. We can be in person next year. We are all hoping for that. Quickly, before we let you go, it, you mentioned that you can always use volunteers. If people want to learn more about Focus Hope or if they want to volunteer or donate, because I would imagine this has been a, a tough time for donations <laughs> as well. How can they get involved? Always. Uh, focushope.edu um, is the best place to go. You can sign up for our volunteer opportunities there. Um, Christy Miller runs our volunteer program, and so she'll connect with you and make sure the days and the times work for you. Um, and then we are pushing out our, our holiday appeal. So we'll pivot right from our Weekend of Hope into our holiday appeal. Um, December 19th, we'll be doing um, a holiday giveaway. So we'll make sure that many of the families that typically come in and get, we, we usually decorate and we take food out to uh, different homes where people rely on us for their holiday meal. Um, we wanted to make sure we could still do that, but we're certainly looking for volunteers to help us. We won't let people come into the building this year. We'll make sure we're ready with a box to put it in people's cars. We don't want volunteers going into seniors' homes, even though in many instances, they built relationships where they'd like to visit with that senior for a while. We just don't want to put any senior at risk this year. So we're making December 19th a very different looking day, but still making sure that everybody gets what they need to have a very different but wonderful holiday season. So focushope.edu is the best place to go to find out everything about Focus Hope. Never leaving anyone behind and connecting with all of those is, is such a great thing to do. Um, it, it, it really is about community and it's about building a neighborhood, even if you don't live next door to one another. Exactly. And I think this is what the pandemic has told us all. We all have to pull, our, pull ourselves up and pull together for our neighbors to make sure that we're checking on one another, make sure we're helping one another. Um, and, and maybe that's the lesson from all of this, right? That we don't, we don't operate um, alone, that we all have to be a part of a bigger and larger community. We so thank you for your time. Portia Roberson with us. She is the CEO of Focus Hope, an organization that has been a fabric of the Detroit community for more than 50 years, continuing the very important work that they do. So we appreciate all that you're doing. If you're looking for an organization to try to get involved with, they can always use some volunteers. We're going to take a quick break here on the Oakland County Megacast. And when we round it out, we are going to end the show talking about bicycle tours in the city of Detroit. This is the Oakland County Megacast. Hi, I'm Dr. Faust, the medical director for the Oakland County Health Division. The most important thing you can do to prevent the spread of illness is to wash your hands thoroughly and often. Follow these six easy steps every time you wash your hands. Step one, turn on the sink and wet your hands with warm water. Step two, apply soap to your hands and lather between your fingers, under your nails, and the front and back of your hands and wrists. Step three, Wash your hands by scrubbing them together for at least 20 seconds. Step four, rinse your hands with warm, clean water. And step five, dry your hands with a clean cloth towel, a paper towel, or hot air blow dryer. If you're using a cloth towel, make sure to change it often. For handheld faucets, turn off the water using a paper towel instead of your bare hand. Step six, if you're using a paper towel, throw it away. Practice healthy habits like washing your hands after coughing or sneezing into them to keep you and others healthy. 
Go to oakgov.com slash health or call Nurse on Call at 1-800-848-5533 to learn more. Michigan, the coronavirus pandemic has put us all to the test. And now it's time to put COVID-19 to the test. As we move forward, testing will be critical. We encourage anyone who has reason to get tested to do so. Those with symptoms and those without. If you are leaving home and going back to work, get tested. If you think you may have COVID-19 or you've been exposed recently through family, friends, or coworkers, get tested. Our test locator tool can help you find the right testing site that fits your needs. Even if you're looking for easy access with no cost, no prescription, and no appointment necessary, we've got you covered. Help Michigan move forward, not backward. To find a testing site or learn more, visit michigan.gov slash coronavirus test. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Just about 15 minutes left here on the Oakland County Megacast. Where does the time go, Tyler? Oh, I, I don't know. It always just slips away from us. Takes I, I will say I love the show because we speak with so many interesting people. We do. We do. Excited to bring on our last guest of the day on the Wednesday edition of the Oakland County Megacast, Kelly Cavanaugh. She is the owner Wheelhouse Detroit Bike Shop. Thank you for being with us on the Oakland County Megacast. Thank you so much for having me. For those who maybe have never been to your shop, you're more than just a shop. Tell us about the Wheelhouse Detroit Bike Shop. Well, first of all, we're very fortunate to be located on the Riverwalk of Detroit. So we're just about three blocks east of the Rensen, um, which is a great, you know, focal point and um, entry point for a lot of people, both locals and tourists. Um, So we are a traditional bike shop in the sense that we do retail and service. We sell bikes, we fix bikes, but partially due to this location that I just mentioned, we also do rentals and tours of course, which were very different this year because. So Kelly, just like uh, so many other people with Zoom, it looks like we're having a little bit of a slowdown um, in your Zoom connection. So we're gonna try to maybe see if we can fix this real quick. Um, This is happening to everyone. I, I, I don't know how teachers do this each and every day. Uh, Tyler, I will tell you that. Um, okay, let's. Uh, I think we have you back. Uh, we're sorry about that, Kelly. How are you? Can you hear us now? I can. Okay, so uh, as you were saying, uh, because of your location? Uh, yes, we're right on the Detroit Riverwalk, so we do offer um, bicycle rentals and tours, as well as the more traditional um, retail and service components of the business. And with that, uh, talk a little bit about the tours that you offer. Sure. Well, so in any other year other than 2020, we would offer um, tours April through October. Um, We have over 20 different tours. So we do everything from neighborhood based tours like Eastern Market, Corktown. Um, And then we have a series of thematic tours such as architecture, urban agriculture, um, auto heritage, music history, and so on and so on. We would typically offer um, public tours for up to 15 people at a time and private tours for up to 20 people at a time. So those are things that are great for like family reunions or a pre-wedding excursion, a workplace outing, all of those kind of things. Um, This year with the pandemic, uh, well, our shop was closed for the first month and a half of our season. And then we didn't even start tours until mid-August, and we're maxing them out at six people just to allow for appropriate social distancing. Um, But the good news is, I mean, these are, not that that's bad, but it definitely was limiting this year. Um, We wanted to be prudent and cautious um, with the virus. Um, But we did, um, we are offering virtual tours now as well. So you'll be able to download um, the route that we've developed and then at each stop on the tour, our tour guide um, meets you virtually via video on your phone. And we'll be standing at the exact same spot that you're standing and talking to you about exactly what you're seeing um, in the video. 
So that's pretty cool. And we've just been working on it. We've got our first two up and um, our third will be up this weekend. That's kind of cool. So like if I have a Peloton or just a bike at home that, uh, you know, like a cycle bike that at home, I could actually take a tour. How long do they typically last? Well, um, they typically last depending on how fast you ride and how long you stop, two to three hours. Um, and while you definitely could do that with a Peloton or an exercise bike, um, they're designed for you to ride the actual route on the city streets. So we really want um, people to get out and experience the city. How did you guys come up with this? Well, this was a result of, you know, I own a seasonal business, so I work really, really hard seven months a year. In five months a year, I plan for the, the next seven months and recover from the previous seven months. Um, and this year, when the pandemic hit, I had just started gearing up. I had actually just published my tour schedule for the year, and I was kind of reeling. I was like, what am I going to do? I mean, I'm already losing, you know, when you lose 1.5 months out of your seven months, that's significant right off the bat. And um, I was <clears throat> in lockdown like everybody else and just thinking, like, what can I do um, to, you know, make this a little bit better? And unfortunately, once the season got started, I wasn't able to have this clarity of thought that I was during lockdown. So it did take me kind of longer. I wish I had been able to launch this back in July, but it is what it is. It launched in September. And like I said, we're getting the third one up um, later this month. But another, a, a funny kind of thing that inspired me in this was a couple years ago, a friend and I were in New Orleans. And I typically, when I visit other cities, either rent a bike or do a bike tour because, you know, I like to do it. And, you know, of course I'm like peeping on other businesses. What are they doing? How are they doing? Are they better than me? Um, and we did a tour of like cocktail history of New Orleans and it was fascinating and it was super fun. But I was thinking how much in a weird way more fun it would have been if my friend and I had been able to do it at our own pace on our own and like kind of like without the bickering hungover newlyweds that were with us. Um, and one of the joys of my business is doing public tours and um, you never know what you're going to get. And I say that in the full meaning of the word. Most of the time I have a great time and meet great people and occasionally there's a rotten apple. And, um, <clears throat> you know, with with the virtual tour, um, you kind of take that take that out of the equation and you can just be with yourself or your friends or your family do it at your own pace and at your own schedule. So for those that maybe, um, uh, because we're not getting a lot of tourists from other states and other countries right now, but if I'm, um, you know, if I live in the suburbs or if I live in Detroit, what would I see on your tour that I wouldn't know before I took it? Well, that's kind of one of the goals with my tours is I like to leave every single one with someone saying, I never knew that. And I've been here a million times. So right off the bat, that's the baseline that all of our tours operate from. We're always trying to um, dig a little bit and they're always looking at things from a historical perspective as well as current events perspective. We're also not, um, uh, we try to be as unbiased as possible. So that does mean that sometimes we talk about the good and the bad. Um, we're not what I would call cheerleaders. So we try and point out pros and cons of developments um, rather than just like reading a press release about a development. So we're talking about things that um, unless you're part of the community, you might not know. So most of our tours are designed um, with, with members of the community. For example, the urban agriculture tour is given by a gentleman that works for Keep Growing Detroit, and he's their education coordinator. So it's not just someone, you know, taking a map of Detroit urban farms and taking you around to them. Um, our architecture tour is given by an architect, and um, you know he's going to talk about everything from the good roads development where the brick streets first started happening in Detroit, all the way to modernism. So. Um, Again, this is like, I'm a huge nerd. So like my baseline is like, I want people to walk away saying, I never knew that before. And I've lived here my entire life. So we hope that now on the other hand, the, the tour that's launching this weekend is our haunted tour. And while there's certainly historical facts in it, it's very fun. That one is like um, more on the cheeky side of things. Like it's not so much scary as it is a little bit irreverent. Kelly B. Cavanaugh with us, the owner of Wheelhouse Detroit Bike Shop, joining us 
on the Oakland County MegaCast today. Um, so for those that are interested in the virtual guided bike tours of Detroit that they can do at their own pace, how do they access the app? Is it a free app? Is it something that they have to pay for? That Correct. So if you go to our website, we have a page dedicated to the virtual tours. It's actually called virtual tours, but it will link you to our app partner, which is called Totago. It's T-O-T-A-T-O. Turn off the app and go outside. Um, and they are an app developer from Northwest, um, the Northwestern US who recently relocated to Detroit. And um, when I was interested in developing a virtual tour, I reached out to Tech Town, um, which I'm sure you guys are very familiar with, and they connected us. And I think that's another great example about this whole thing is like Detroit is always willing to connect and to partner um, during this pandemic, I've seen that time and time again, businesses, um, not just my own, pivoting in really creative ways. And um, it was cool to, I never thought I'd be working with an app developer in my life. So, you know, um, you live and you learn. So uh, looking at that, uh, we are all living and learning during this crisis, but connections have been vital to survival. If the state does go into another shutdown, would you be able to survive? Well, that's a really good question. Um, so I'm always designed, I call it like chipmunking to, to like hoard away a little bit of money to get through those five months that I mentioned um, earlier. So our last day of operation for this, for this year will be November 1st, which is weirdly good timing um, if there's another shutdown. So I will be ready to open mid-March, beginning of April, fine. And that's, I guess, the pro of a seasonal business. The cons are you really have to con- you know, get all your business in when you can. So this year, that was actually even more so the case. So, um, and thankfully, because of like a PPP loan, that got me you know, my first month sort of rolling where normally I wouldn't have started off with with that. Not that I got a ton of money, but it was enough to get me through the first month. So um, I'm actually well positioned to be ready for spring 2021. Again, whatever that looks like. And let's hope that we have a nice mild winter so that you can start those tours again in March. (laughs) And, you know, because sometimes we do still have snow. And have you ever thought about... um, maybe continuing the rides through December to see the Christmas lights and, or something like that, because so Campus Martius is we beautiful. We have tried that in previous years and you'll always get like a half dozen hearty souls. There are people that ride year round, um, but the tours really not so much. People are looking for a pleasurable experience, not like a forced march, you know what I mean? Kelly Cavanaugh with us here on the Oakland County Mega Cash. She is the owner of Wheelhouse Detroit Bike Shop. So, Kelly, uh, just about another minute here left with you on the Oakland County Mega Cast. For those that are interested, and I will tell you, I'm extremely interested in your haunted tour, so I hope it's not sold out yet. Give us some details. Where can we find the information? What is the cost? And can you bring your own bike, or do you have to rent one from you? So um, I am so sorry to disappoint you. Our haunted tours are sold out. I should preface that by saying our public tours are, are all sold out. We are still booking private tours all the way through November 1st. A private tour costs either $200 or $250, depending on if it's a weekday or a weekend, for up to six people. So it's one person who wants to shell out that much money, or it's six people who all chip in together. Um, so if you want to book one, and that can be with your own bike or with our bikes, no problem. So um, you can go to wheelhousedetroit.com. You can email us to get one booked, info at wheelhousedetroit.com. Obviously, that's not much time. There's only about nine days left in our season, but we do still have about three or four openings, so it is it is possible. Um, if that doesn't work out for you, this weekend, our Haunted Tour will launch virtually, and that costs $15. So you can download that for yourself and your family or for just yourself and, um, yes. and ride it on your own, and you'll get to see me mugging about the Nine Rouge and David Whitney and the Leland Hotel and lots of other fun stuff. It sounds like a blast. We encourage everyone to do it. Thank you so much for your time with us here, Kelly, on the Oakland County Megacast. That's going to wrap it up for the Wednesday edition. We'll be back tomorrow at 10 a.m.